So, first to introduce myself, uh, I'm Steve Bale. I work for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, which is one of five regional commissions of the United Nations. Uh, we're based in Geneva, and despite the, the name, Economic Commission for Europe, we actually cover a, a slightly wider range because our definition of Europe includes North America and quite a lot of Asia as well. So pretty well the, the whole of the, the northern half of the northern hemisphere, uh, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, we say. But in addition to that, the, the UNECE activities are open to any United Nations member country. And that's the reason why we have, for instance, Australia and New Zealand represented here. Uh, we've had Korea involved in some of the work, and we've had inputs from pretty well all around the world. So what we're talking about here is actually pretty well a global initiative. My role in UNECE is that I'm the head of the Statistical Information and Methodology Unit, which means that I'm responsible for pretty well all horizontal activities, uh, IT, metadata, quality, methodologies, dissemination, all those sort of things. I'm going to say a little bit about the context first, and uh, this is actually a slide I borrowed from one of your colleagues, Martin Bookson. And this is designed to illustrate the, the challenges that we're facing in official statistics with something called the data deluge. Uh, huge amounts of data that are becoming available. And this graph shows the, the growth in digital information available in the world uh, from 2006 to 2011. The, the scale on the side is exabytes, which is basically a large number. It's, it's a lot of information. But the important thing here is not so much the, the scale, the actual values, it's the growth rate. So tenfold growth in five years in the amount of digital information in the world. But let's just project that a bit. That's where we think could be by 2020, or at least the, the leading industry experts think it could be. So vast amounts of data, quite a challenge for us. Here's a, just a little fact to, to reinforce that. So during the last two years, more information created than in the whole of the rest of human history. Quite a scary fact. And that's happening every two years or so at the moment. Another background factor to this work is the possibility of competition, mainly from the private sector, because they start to realize that data have a value. Data are a commodity that can be bought and sold. So we already have Google experimenting with real-time price indices, so monitoring price changes on the day rather than six, eight weeks after the event, as official statistics tends to. They're also developing their public data explorer, so a dissemination platform for statistics from pretty well any source. At the same time, we've got people like Facebook. Uh, any day now, they will reach one billion users. That's quite a, a heavy population, a lot of data there. Store cards, the, the cards you use in supermarkets to maybe get a small discount, you're actually selling a lot of data about yourself very cheaply through those store cards. Credit agencies, all sorts of other people with big databases. If they start to put their data together, and this is already happening in some cases, if they link all of their data, then they start to create super registers, maybe registers that even go well beyond national boundaries. And could these linked data sets start to provide a plausible alternative to official statistics? The example I, I give here is uh, traditional population census has a very high cost. I know in the Netherlands you're moving to register-based census, so it's not quite so appropriate for you. But the countries that still have a traditional paper-based census, perhaps governments could be persuaded that the cost of an alternative from the private sector could be worth it 
if the private sector can offer what they claim to be equivalent data for a fraction of the price, I think many governments would be tempted in the current financial climate. And maybe our arguments about quality of official statistics would not be enough to counter the potential cash savings. So linked data could be extremely important as a challenge. All statistical organizations are, follow, are facing challenges related to efficiency. Increased demands, more flexibility, shrinking budgets, challenges with response burden, lots of pressures to reduce the, the response burden on businesses and households, and basically doing more with less. At the same time, there are a few enablers of change, technological, methodological advances, the increasing collaboration that we're seeing between statistical organizations. <clears throat> So if we put all that together, then that really means that uh, we have the right climate for some sort of change in official statistics. So the response of the official statistics community is mainly channeled through a, a group called the, the High Level Group for Strategic Developments in Business Architecture in Statistics. Uh, a long name for a, a relatively small group. A group of 10 heads of national and international organizations chaired by Hossa. And the important thing here is that it's heads of national and international organizations. And this is the, really the first group that has brought people together at that level to look at these issues of modernizing official statistics. So it's got quite a lot of decision-making power, quite a lot of authority in the statistical community, and is really helping to start make things happen. I've got here a few short extracts from a vision document that the High Level Group produced last year and was endorsed by the, the Conference of European Statisticians. So basically we have to reinvent our products and our processes to adapt to a changed world, to meet those challenges that I outlined a few minutes ago. And a very important point here because all organizations are facing the same challenges, and these challenges are big, often too big for individual statistical organizations to tackle on their own, we need to work together in the international statistical community for the sake of efficiency. This is a diagram that comes from that high-level group vision document. And what this is all about is looking at the way that we produce official statistics and trying to bring it into a framework of common standards. At the top, we have the generic statistical business process model, which I'll say a few words about in a few minutes, and also the, the GSIM, the generic statistical information model, which is what we're developing at the moment. And down here, we have common methods, standard technologies. And the idea is that the, the big gray square represents statistical production at the moment. What we're trying to do is move the production process into the smaller box, the more efficient space, which is defined by standards. So standardizing the, the production of official statistics. And if we can standardize the production, then that, of course, is, is more efficient, saves resources. That allows us to focus more on flexibility of outputs, the products. So that's the, the, the basic ideas behind the vision of the high-level group. So the next step was to develop a strategy to transform the vision into reality. So new products, maybe using new data sources, so the huge amount of data that are out there give us all sorts of possibilities for creating new outputs that wouldn't have been possible a few years ago. Rationalized processes, so the, the standardization that I was just talking about. There's a term here, uh, plug and play architecture. And this is about configuring the way we produce statistics rather like a set of Lego blocks. If you think about Lego blocks, you can make a model, you can take one block out, 
and put another one in its place because the Lego blocks have standard interfaces. They're easily exchangeable. And that's the basic idea behind plug and play architecture. We use standard processes as building blocks to produce statistics. And the GSIM, the, the information model, is about defining the standard interfaces between those blocks. Another important part of the strategy is that organizations need to change. Organizational structures, uh, the, the competencies of the staff, uh, the way that staff are recruited and trained, all need to be modernized to support new processes, new products. And we have a group that met uh, just over a week ago in Budapest of uh, human resource managers from statistical agencies that's looking specifically at this aspect. So this strategy was endorsed by the Conference of European Statisticians in June this year. And as Hossa said, uh, quite enthusiastically, we were positively surprised at the support that we received for this strategy. So trying to summarize that, what it means for statistics. So if we use common standards, we should be able to produce statistics in a more efficient way. A point in the middle that is perhaps contentious, particularly with those responsible for subject matter domains in statistics, is that under the idea of a standardized statistical system, no domain is treated as special in terms of the production process. Of course, the outputs are special, but the production process should be standardized to the maximum extent possible to realize the efficiency savings. So that leads us to really the, perhaps the, the way forward in development in official statistics. We should look to see whether any new methods and tools will support this vision of standardization or reinforce the stovepipe subject matter-based mentality that many organizations still have. Okay, so that's the, the context in terms of the, the background and the high-level group work. I'm going to say a little bit about the generic statistical business process model because it's important to understand that to get a proper understanding of what we're doing with the information model. So we need a, a business process model to try to define and describe the different steps of the statistical production process in a coherent way. And this allows us to have a, a common vocabulary when we're discussing statistical production. And having a common vocabulary allows us to benchmark the production processes much more easily uh, within organizations and between organizations. And if we can benchmark our processes, we can identify best practices, and we can make better decisions about the development of our production systems and the organization of our resources in statistical organizations. I'll give here the example of the Irish Central Statistical Office. They're using the, the GSPPM as a tool to monitor and manage the costs of the different parts of statistical production in their office. So they're organizing their resources based on the GSPPM. So this is the, the model itself, or rather the, the picture that most people see as the model. The idea behind the, the business process model is that all statistical production can be divided into nine standard phases, specifying needs, designing, building, collecting, processing, analyzing, disseminating, archiving, evaluating. So we can describe statistical production in terms of those phases. For each of those phases, we can identify a number of sub-processes, the pink boxes on the screen. And in fact, we could go at least one, maybe two, even three layers below that. But when we were developing this model, we realized that this is the point at which we stop if we want to have something that is generic, that is standard internationally. 
So national implementations of the model often have more layers of detail. Some key features of the model. It's not a linear model. You don't start in the, the top left corner and work through all the boxes in turn. The model is more like a, a matrix through which there are many possible paths depending on the production process. And it's possible to have iterations of a, a regular process that don't go through all of the, the phases. So if you have a monthly data collection, you don't specify needs, uh, design and build systems every month. You do that perhaps every few years when you review the, the process. This slide just illustrates that, perhaps in a graphical way. The blue dots are just showing some sample statistical production process moving through the model. It's just had a little loop there between analysis and process, perhaps to, to check on some data, to, to re-impute or to, to recode some data. And when it reaches the end, evaluation, in this case, it's gone straight back to collect because of course, all of the, the designing and the building has already been done in the first iteration. So this approach is used by at least 50 statistical organizations worldwide, uh, national and international organizations. And we keep hearing of new applications pretty well every week. It's being used to manage, to document statistical production. And, for example, here is uh, perhaps one of the latest that we've heard about, an adaptation of the model uh, from Turkey. So their model is, is basically the GSPPM. And the idea is that many countries, Netherlands included, has something that is very close to the GSPPM and can easily be mapped to it, but also allows for some national flexibility depending on the national circumstances. Okay, so now onto the, the main subject, the, the information model. Now this middle box perhaps should be thought of as one of the pink boxes in the GSBPM diagram. So this is a, a GSBPM sub-process, but that's not enough just to have a, a list of sub-processes. You have to be able to describe what's flowing between those sub-processes. So the inputs and the outputs. And that's where GSIM comes in. It's a complementary model that defines and describes these inputs and outputs in terms of statistical information objects. Now, of course, the obvious input is, is data, but also we have all sorts of parameters. Uh, we have things like uh, rules governing the process, we have classifications, we have all sorts of other things that are inputs. Something happens based on all of those inputs, and we have some outputs, usually some sort of transformed data, maybe process metrics, and of course metadata flowing through the whole thing. So the, G the GSIM is really describing these objects that, that make the GSBPM work. This slide is just another view uh, of the same sort of thing, looking at the example of data validation. So we have input data uh, based on information objects, conceptual objects. We have some sort of rule-based decision point. Something happens to the data. Maybe there's some imputation for some values, not for others. We have a, an output data set here. And this is governed by activity and production information objects, which contain the rules and the, the, the background information to make the process happen. This is something that came up from the first sprint in Korea. Uh, we were talking to the head of the, Slo uh, sorry, in Slovenia. We were talking to the head of the Slovenian Statistical Office, and she said, Okay, I think I understand it. It's something like the body, and the GSPPM are the organs, and the GSIM is the blood flowing between those organs. Now, that's not totally semantically correct, but it's perhaps a, an easy way to think about uh, GSPPM and GSIM. Okay. 
Okay. Now in GSIM, we've been developing lists of information objects that can be standard across all of uh, statistical production. And we've done that by grouping them into four main headings. Uh, information objects relating to statistical activity, the statistical program management. Information objects related to production, which is mostly things like rules and decision points that influence the processing of statistics. The information category, which is, is mainly the, the data themselves, and the conceptual side, which includes things like classifications. Now within those, we've identified then lower level information objects that can be standard. And in fact, this diagram only shows a little part of the picture. We could have shown you some huge UML diagrams with lots of boxes, lots of arrows and things. But <coughs> for one point, they're not that easy to read on a screen like this because the, the text is far too small. And they, they tend to be a bit scary to people who are not used to that sort of modeling. So beneath this, there's another much more detailed layer, which is really what the purpose of this week has been, uh, to finalize, to, to document, to standardize that much more detailed layer of information objects.